Crypto Hoppers. British medicine through time, Industrial Revolution Medicine, 1700 to 1900, part one. We will cover ideas on causes, germ theory, and prevention. Important. The two C's, continuity and change. There will always be questions asking you to compare time periods. So make sure in each video you listen out for words to do with continuation or change. Ideas of causes. Until 1700, there had been significant continuity in the ideas on the causes of disease. People believed the cause was either God, miasma, or the four humours. However, during the Industrial Revolution, many old ideas were abandoned due to the continuing decline in the power of the church, paralleled by the increase of scientific breakthrough. Ideas that stopped. The four humours theory was no longer believed as cause of disease. Supernatural ideas such as astrology were no longer used to diagnose. And with the decline of the church, people no longer believed in God as a cause. Ideas that continued. The miasma theory remained popular amongst the population and even Florence Nightingale and Edward Chadwick supported it. Cities in industrial Britain were filthy with poor sanitation. People could see it and smell it, so they thought it caused disease. New ideas. Spontaneous generation. In the 1700s, a new theory grew as microscopes allowed scientists to see bacteria on decaying items, for example, fruit. Scientists thought these germs were spontaneously generated by the decay and then spread the disease further. This idea was only believed by scientists and eventually proved to be wrong by germ theory, but it was still progress. Germ theory. In 1861, Pasteur was able to prove spontaneous generation was wrong. He showed bacteria and germs in the air caused decay. This theory was developed by Robert Koch, who proved that bacteria cause disease, for example, TB and cholera. This theory became the basis for identifying bacterial disease even now and had a significant impact. But at the time, most doctors and the government didn't accept this theory immediately and it took until 1900 for it to be widely believed. Still, scientists in the early 18th century no longer believed in the four humours and with new powerful microscopes, they could see microbes and they began to think of new ideas, such as spontaneous generation. Louis Pasteur and germ theory. Germ theory claimed the air is full of microbes. Microbes cause decay and also disease. Microbes can be killed by heating them, otherwise known as pasteurization. Pasteur made a huge breakthrough. He proved that germs were all around us and some were harmful and could cause disease. He did this through experiments on milk, beer and animals. In the short term, there was little impact on doctors like Henry Bastian. He refused to accept germ theory and continued to believe spontaneous generation. It took a long time to convince people, but a German scientist developed the work. Robert Koch, aka father of bacteriology. In 1876, he discovered the bacteria which caused anthrax. This was a major breakthrough. It was the first time anyone had identified a specific microbe that caused a specific disease. He later discovered the bacteria that caused TB and cholera, proving Jon Snow right. He published his methods. These involved growing bacteria using agar jelly and a petri dish. This would grow cultures of pure bacteria, allowing Koch to identify specific bacteria causing disease. Koch had a serious impact. He invented a method to grow and sustain bacteria to make them easier to identify. Doctors now began to seek ways to attack the microbe that caused disease rather than just the symptoms, a huge turning point. He inspired other scientists to discover the causes of pneumonia and tetanus. 
His methods are still used to this day. The importance of germ theory. This theory solved the ideas on what caused disease. By the 20th century, it was widely accepted and developed. Scientists now look at preventing disease-causing microbes through Jenner's vaccinations and antiseptics and new treatments that can be developed with this new understanding. The theory also affected almost everything in medicine. It was the most important medical breakthrough of the industrial period. Impact on ideas of causes. It identified the actual cause, so it ended ideas, even if it was slow in doing so. Koch was able to prove John Snow's theory on cholera, and the study of bacteriology in the 20th century had enormous impact on our understanding of the causes of disease. Impact on prevention. The theory allowed the development of vaccinations from the work of Jenner, who previously couldn't prove his work. Pasteur Institute was able to develop vaccines for rabies, anthrax, TB and the plague. Vaccines remain common practice to this day, wiping out diseases such as smallpox. The government was encouraged to spend money on public health in the long term, with the Public Health Act of 1975 being the largest intervention in British history. Impact on care and hospitals Although Florence Nightingale was mistrustful of germ theory, the improving understanding of germs led to improvements in hospital design. This included large windows, well-ventilated rooms and easy clean surfaces. Nurses and doctors now began to wash their hands and clothing and use sterilised equipment and clothing in treatment and care, thus reducing the chance of infection. Impact on treatment there was little short-term impact as there was no way to directly treat diseases, but the understanding of germ theory impacted surgery. As Joseph Lister believed germ theory, he directly developed carbolic acid spray as an antiseptic in 1865. Germ theory led to the increased development of aseptic surgery, which was removing all germs from operating theatres before surgery. This kept operating theatres free from germs and led to a reduction in death rates from infection. From 1887, all instruments were steam cleaned and sterilised and surgeons wore rubber gloves and masks. The long-term impact is that scientists could now look at treating specific diseases as Koch has identified the bacteria which cause diseases like anthrax and smallpox. As a result of this, in the 20th century, scientists could focus on the production of the first antibiotic, like penicillin. Prevention Edward Jenner and vaccinations Jenner was the first to make a discovery that successfully prevented people from catching the deadly disease smallpox. He created the first vaccine, a method to prevent disease. It was the first breakthrough of the industrial age that started huge improvements in the prevention of disease. Smallpox In the 18th century, it killed more children than any other disease. Thousands of adults died too. Survivors were often left with terrible scars. Epidemics of smallpox were common in the 18th century. Edward Jenner he trained in London as a surgeon and apothecary before working at St George's Hospital. Then he returned to Gloucestershire to work as a GP. Here he made the discovery that milkmaids who caught cowpox never caught smallpox. He decided to test and experiment the idea, even though he didn't fully understand it. Vaccination and smallpox since the 1720s, doctors like the Sutton brothers had been inoculating thousands of people against smallpox. They were infected with an amount of smallpox. This involved spreading pus from a smallpox scab into a cut in the skin of a healthy person so that the person would catch a mild case of smallpox. The body would then build up a resistance to it so the person did not catch it again. However, only the rich could afford this. It didn't always work and it was very risky. 
Many died from trying. The inoculated person might get a strong dose of smallpox and die, or pass the disease on to someone else. Jenna followed this with interest and noted when he treated people for the disease of cowpox, they never caught smallpox. In the 1790s, he used scientific methods to test his theory. He infected local people with a controlled dose of cowpox and then tried to infect them with smallpox. None caught smallpox. In 1798, he wrote up his findings, but he didn't know how to explain it. This was before germ theory. The Royal Society refused to publish his findings, so he paid to print them himself and his ideas began to spread. In 1802, the Royal Janarian Society was set up to promote vaccines and by 1804 it had vaccinated 12,000 people, but it took time to get popular in Britain because of opposition. Eventually, after a smallpox epidemic killed 35,000 in 1837-40, the government banned inoculation and from 1840 agreed to pay for vaccinations for children. In 1852, the government made the smallpox vaccination compulsory, but they only forced it from 1872. In 1966, the World Health Organization decided to embark on what they called an intensified 10-year smallpox eradication program. By 1977, the WHO announced that smallpox had been wiped out. Opposition to vaccines some thought it was wrong to give people an animal's disease. Vaccines interfered with God's plan for humans. Some people didn't like government control and forced vaccines. Doctors who inoculated lost money when the government offered free vaccinations. The government and scientists couldn't see any scientific proof and were therefore reluctant. Impact of Jenner and vaccinations In the short term, the smallpox vaccine saved many lives. Over 100,000 around the world were vaccinated by 1800, even Napoleon's army. But there was a slow uptick of vaccinations at first due to opposition. There was also an incorrect use of vaccines and lack of government support. In the long term, Jenner showed vaccines worked and he inspired Pasteur and Koch to search for more vaccines. But the method couldn't be used for other diseases, so no new vaccines until the 1900s. It also led to the eventual government enforcement of vaccinations, and smallpox was eradicated by the 1970s. Prevention, public health, Living conditions. The population in 1850 boomed to 20 million. The greatest change was the growth of towns, where 85% of people now lived. This caused overcrowding and poor sanitation with no running water, shared toilets and few sewage systems. One result of these living conditions was the frequent outbreaks of epidemics like cholera, notably in 1854. Edwin Chadwick. In 1842, the government official Edwin Chadwick completed a report on living conditions in British cities. He found life expectancy in cities was lower than in the countryside at 38 years. In Liverpool, it was 15. The unhealthy living conditions in cities through overcrowding, no sewage disposal and poor diet were causing poor health in the poor. The rotting sewage and filth was causing miasma, which made people ill. He recommended forcing local councils to do something about public health by building new sewer systems, removing waste and supplying water. Was he important? In the early 1800s, the government followed a laissez-faire approach to public health. This meant it didn't feel it was its role to improve living conditions or public health, and it didn't want to interfere. However, 
When Chadwick's report was published, it helped create awareness of the need for government intervention. As a result, they passed the first Public Health Act of 1848. The National Board of Health was set up. The government could force some town councils to improve water and sewage. Local councils were told to collect taxes to pay for public health improvements. Councils were allowed to appoint medical officers. The aim was to improve sanitary conditions within towns in England and Wales, but it wasn't compulsory and this was pre-germ theory, so many local councils did nothing and public health didn't improve. There was a turning point from the 1850s. The government's policy towards public health took a drastic turn due to a number of events and factors. The 1854 and 1866 cholera outbreaks killed thousands, with the government hopeless to prevent it until Jon Snow identified, but couldn't prove, the link between the water supply and cholera. Pasteur's germ theory in 1861 proved that bacteria cause disease. This ended the idea that miasma caused disease. Scientific proof made people want public health reform. Changes in public health. The government's attitude to public health changed over time and after several epidemics of diseases such as cholera, they began to realise that they must take further responsibility for public health. Furthermore, when working class men got the vote from 1867, politicians now had to appeal to voters who wanted better living conditions. From the 1860s onwards, the government began to take more action to improve living conditions in cities. 1,300 miles of sewers were built in London after the Great Stink in 1858. The heat exacerbated the smell of untreated human waste and industrial effluent that was present on the banks of the River Thames. Slums in Birmingham were demolished, and in Leeds, dumping sewage into the river was banned. The government took its biggest ever steps to improve public health and improve the prevention of disease in the Public Health Act of 1875. As a result, cholera didn't outbreak again in London. The 1875 Public Health Act. City authorities had to provide clean water to stop diseases spreading from dirty water, sewers to dispose of waste properly, public toilets, street lighting, public parks for exercise, and public health officers were to inspect lodging houses, the building of new homes, and quality of food sold. The end. Thanks for watching and remember to like and subscribe. In the next video, we'll cover how surgery changed, care in hospitals, cholera as a case study, progress and change.